Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Focus on Liberia. This is our start of the program, FOL Marketplace. This afternoon, we're going to be discussing auditing. That's in general, not just Liberia. Auditing everywhere and anything. I have my co-host, Mr. William Bernard King. Mr. King, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you very much to all our listeners and viewers that are turning in today. This is going to be a very interesting topic. I know when you think audit, you think it's boring, but no, it is not boring. And you really want to tune in because auditing is so important because it can impact your savings, your, your retirement, and so forth. And today joining us, we have Cheryl Rare, which we'll be talking a little bit about, and Mr. Alexander Cuffey. These are our two Liberian finest auditors. They are uh, serving in uh, professional capacities in the United States of America. And also they do some work, maybe occasionally internationally. So without uh, so much talking and so forth, what I will start with, I will start with our disclaimer and I will go straight into our brief bio uh, before introducing our two guests. And I will also be giving an introductory remark about auditing so we can get this thing started. So the content for Focus on Liberia is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained on our media or written document constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by Focus on Liberia or any third party service provider to buy or sell any securities other financial instruments in this or in any other jurisdiction in which such media material may be shared. All content on the site is information of a general nature and does not address the circumstances of any particular individual or entity. Nothing in the media constitutes professional and financial advice, nor does any information on the platform constitute a comprehensive or complete statement of the matters discussed or the laws related thereto. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our panelists, I would first like to you to focus your attention on Mr. Alex Coffey, auditor professional. Uh, he's worked for Price Waterhouse Coopers for a number of years, which is the number one accounting firm in the world, headquartered in the U.S. and over 170 countries. He's also worked as an internal auditor in the U.S. and in Liberia. He finalized the strategy that gave birth to the internal auto. Audit Secretariat, which is now the internal audit agency that is in Liberia. And he has been an instructor of audit at the university level for 12 years. Our other guest who's joining us for the first time on Focus on Liberia is Cheryl kranga Re. I hope I pronounced that name well. Please give a wave, Cheryl. <laughs> and I will tell you a little bit about her. Who says University of Liberia doesn't produce talent? Well, it does, big time. She graduated from the University of Liberia in 1986 with a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics, minor in Economics. She completed 24 credits in accounting from Bucks Community College, Newton, Pennsylvania, and William Patterson University, Wayne, New Jersey, respectfully. She earned a master's degree in public administration from Rutgers University, Newark, New Jersey in 2017. She worked extensively with the state of New Jersey as a tax investigator, auditor, and conferee, who would like to know more about what that is, from 1991 to 2019. She retired August 1st, 2019, and now a private citizen. She says she is a Christian and in affiliate with the Lutheran Church of the Redeemer located in Trenton, New Jersey. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is our panelists. As you can see, we're packing a very powerful, mighty punch about what we're going to be talking about today. We are so I want to welcome all our viewers. Uh, if you are just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. In a very unique way, we want to say welcome to our first guest, first to be on the show, uh, Mrs. Cheryl Kringa Resch. Cheryl, welcome to Focus on Liberia. This is water. Welcome. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for having me. And uh, also part of our uh, focus on liberal marketplace is Mr. Ellis Coffey. Mr. Coffey, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Uh, 
Alex, you are on a uh, mute for a little bit. Um, you're on mute, Alex. There you go. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, William. Yeah. It's good to be back. Thank you. Well, Dennis, um, we're starting this series. And uh, it's a very important series, more than what people realize. And I have a two-minute uh, introductory about the importance of audits, real life where it hits. That's very necessary. Go for it. Okay. In 2000, the major companies of the era, Microsoft, Dell, Computer, Texaco, and Chevron, were making between 20 to $40 billion a year. Enron, an energy com company, was ranked number one. They were making $100 billion a year with under 20,000 employees. And in December 2000, their shares were $90.56. The accounting firm that represented Enron was Arthur Anderson, one of the big five. While October 12, 2001, Arthur Anderson legal counsel through certain things that were going on, they advised the auditor to destroy all Enron files except Enron most basic documents. In November of that year, Enron admitted to inflating its income by around 586 million since 1997. In November 29th, Arthur Anderson becomes another casualty of Enron scandal and the SEC expands this investigation. Now we went from having the big five accounting firm in the US which Mr. Coffey was part of one of them, Price Waterhouse Cooper is one of them, while Arthur Anderson was no more. And it was convicted of obstruction of justice. And so the shareholders lost about $74 billion. And Enron went down as one of the biggest scandals um, of the decade in 2000. And from there was birthed the Sarbanes Oxley Act that uh, most of us are familiar with um, at least one. And also Arthur Anderson lost big, a lot of employees got laid off and it is no more. So ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about audits, it's important, it's tied to your the shareholder value, to your stock value and to your investment. So what they will be talking about is the importance of audits as we launch this series very critical in the financial world and is something that cannot be overlooked because if it's colluded or like our uh, good gentleman Anthony Weir was will say, if the auditors sit down and drinking king juice with the company owners, that is not a good thing. And so ladies and gentlemen, we <laughs> launched our series. And with that being said, we start with uh, the first question for our panelists. We get straight into it. Audit. What is it? Who would like to take a stab at it? Cheryl? Oh, uh, um, yeah. Alex, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, audit, well, the official definition of audit is, um, is an official inspection of an individual's or an organization's accounts. Um, so pretty much what um, the audit does is to analyze and evaluate something for accuracy. Um, so that's, that's in a nutshell what, what audit is. Hmm. Thank you very much. Is that well, simple I'm, enough? I mean, um, <laughs> yes, yes, it's, it's, it is very simple. Give us a, a little background of um, audit. Give us how did it come about? Is it an old profession or is it something that, you know, new? Give us a little, you know, taste of it. Where did it come from? Um, I would defer to Alex to give the historical perspective. Um, what I would deal with is uh, pretty much uh, my professional experience as to why audits were selected. So let me defer to my senior Alex, to um, senior in terms of um, his experience as a detailed auditor to give us a historical perspective. All right, beasts. <laughs> Thank you for deferring to me. The, 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 it goes it goes back into the 1800s. You know, um, it mostly had to do with um, 
say in America where they, when companies, the, the development of accounting goes way back. But then as uh, companies grew up and then uh, more people started owning companies together um, and even government back in the days in the 1800s, um, owners of company didn't want to be bad at every time coming to check, coming to check. And these reports that were being sent to them, you know, basically whether they understood or not, it was different things. So the having of auditing started with that, with the fact that um, owners of companies, shareholders and things wanted to um, relax and have somebody look over their shoulder for them. So as a result, the different, um, the audit, the, 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 the profession auditing started, which is, you know, like it's a branch of accounting, but it started. So those days, um, they had private firms, they had different firms. And then as you, as um, Willem said, now we have the big four. But before that time, we had all these different you know, auditing companies coming together and they were merging, there were different mergers. So um, that's how auditing started to ensure that we, the, the shareholders were getting the value for their money. They were rest assured. They were provided that assurance that whatever figures that were coming out that were tying up to their any per shares and the shares on the, the, the way the shares were being sold were okay. So it provided that reasonable assurance. So as Cheryl said, in addition to what Cheryl said, uh, auditing is also an advisory service. It provides an advisory service. It provides that second eye of that gave comfort to owners of companies, people that have that bought shares in the company, uh, people that also providing finances such as banks and other financial institutions to have that assurance that where they're putting their money, they will get their money's worth. And I, I like that definition so much. So let me go back to you, Cheryl. Based on the definition you gave, what can be audited? Um, well, there are different things that can be audited. Um, again, audit really is evaluation and examination of books and records. Okay, so I come from the public um, sector, the governmental um, auditing. Um, so where I worked, what we did was we audited businesses. And those businesses, um, the different taxes that they were set up for. Say, for instance, if you as a taxpayer decided or a business person decided that you wanted to do business in my state, um, what you did was you registered with the Secretary of State as well as um, the division. And then you indicated that you were um, going to be a corporation, sole proprietorship, or even an LLC, which is a limited liability corp. Now, if you were a corporation, you were li liable for corporation business tax. And, and also, if you were selling goods or services that required you to collect sales tax on behalf of the um, government, um, you had to be set up for that as well. Now, in addition to that, you could have had employees. That would mean you had employers withholding tax. For those of us who work for, for um, any anybody for that matter, if you're not, if you're not a, um, a privately owned um, business, um, if you work as an employee, um, you have taxes withheld every two weeks when you get paid. So that tax is considered payroll tax, uh, which is employers withholding tax. So those are some of the taxes that you will be set up for and the business will be set up for. And based on that, it would require that you remit the taxes on time. And if in the event that for whatever reason you were triggered for an audit, there comes <coughs> the auditor to come in and examine all of those documents to ensure that you are reporting accurately. Mm. So you receive this money on behalf of government. Are you giving it to government? And we want to make sure that is being done. 
Absolutely. And I, I would stress on because sales tax was my area of specialty. Yes, I audited other taxes like corporation business tax, employers withholding tax, and what have you, motor fuels, whatever. So, for instance, if sales tax, which again was my specialty, if you collected sales tax, like if you, Mr. Ja, went to a store and you purchased an item, when you, re, when you pay sales tax, when they charge you the receipt and the sales tax, you're entrusting that owner to collect that tax on your behalf and remit it to your state. I believe the state that you live in have similar similar requirements. Right. Now, if in the event that person did not remit, the, the, the business owner did not remit the tax on your behalf, this is where the auditor will come in to determine if he remitted or didn't, or if he even shortchanged. Because technically it is trust fund, it is not his money, and it, it was his responsibility because he said, I want to do business in your state. So yes, we entrusted you to remit money on our behalf. Hmm. Alex, let me come to you because I want to lay this, the groundwork on uh, what can be audited. Now, uh, and, you know, accounting background, can, who, who performs this auditing and what, again, what can be audited? Can I audit my own life? Can I audit my personal records? <laughs> Can I audit, you know, maybe my Facebook account? <laughs> you know, give me some real life examples without being, you know, simple things that can be audited. Okay, with, without being theoretical. But um, the question that you ask, um, and the way Cheryl answered it, um, so she's answering it on a more the practical side, the, the governmental side, with respect to, to tax uh, accounting. Now, so what in, in, her exa- in her definition or explanation, to answer your question also, what can be ta- uh, audited? Your tax record can be audited. The fact that the, 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 the state or the country is supposed to collect those taxes from people who sell, you know, provide goods and services, um, business people, they are supposed to pay taxes. And they, of course, they, they present figures. Those uh, sales that are collected, they have figures. Those figures have to be proven. So if you're talking about what, now it goes beyond that. So if I take you to the classroom, now we just define auditing. In addition to the definition of auditing, they different types, there are different classification of auditing. So it depends on what you want to audit and where you sit. So if you're finding yourself within an organization and you're auditing, you are doing what we call internal auditing. So you are within the organization, that's internal audit. So the person who is, who audits internally is called an internal audit. If you're coming from outside from a auditing firm and coming into an institution to audit, you that's external auditing. So you are called an external audit auditor. Now there are also there's also the tax auditing that uh, Cheryl was talking about. Now we also have other types of auditing, um, you can audit uh, financial statements. That is, what fee, at the end of the day, every institution, whether it be a church, be a susu club, be a, a government, be a um, any huge company, hmm. have to produce, basically, they have to produce financial statement, which uh, contains at the basic level, a balance sheet, an income statement, and a cash flow statement. So your transaction for a given period, maybe a year, all the things you say you bought, all the revenue you say you collected, every transaction you've done all accumulates into the financial statement. So the financial audit comprising of auditing the financial statement, the figures that the company say they've accumulated in the financial statement. 
that balance sheet, that income statement, that cash flow statement, and the statement of UNO equity depends can be audited by the auditor. That is financial audit. So if you want to know what is audited, yes, the figures in order to record the accessions. So those accessions, those figures and representation, those other things, those things that you explain in a financial statement, they will be audited, they will be examined, they will be checked, evidences will be gathered. So for the auditor to express an opinion, and that opinion provides the reasonable assurance, not absolute, the reasonable assurance that those figures represent the operation of that entity for the period, we can say for the period then ended, for that period. That period can be a quarter, that period can be a year, and so forth. There's also um, compliance audit. Compliance means whether you comply with laws, you comply with regulations, and you comply with even your own internal policies. Because every entity is required to document policies and procedures and processes that they go by that conform to national, industrial, and international standards. For example, how well did you calculate the taxes, the employee taxes that comply with what the internal revenue said or what the internal revenue laws and regulations are? How well did you comply with the industry rules? How well did you comply with government rules, government laws, and government regulations? That's compliance okay. audit. They also have production audit. And, and we can Alex, also check production. Alex, we're going, to, we're going to get to the different types of audits. We want to lay some basis here. Let me go back to Cheryl mm-hmm. before uh, I bring uh, William in because he speaks financial language too. I don't. When I was growing up, you know, I was told if you if you guy, you like money, you will steal. So I was always afraid of money. <laughs> <laughs> so so Cheryl, uh, Auditors are not medicine people. They are not, you know, like they are not wage doctors, right? So they, so what is it as a as an auditor? What is it that you need when you say we're going to audit? What is it that you're looking for? We usually we have, like Alex said, the terms of reference or the uh, the um, we we first start with give, giving you what we call a record request. We look at the, and I will speak again from the um, tax perspective, from the governmental audit side of it. So we give you a record request saying, we send you a notice telling you that we're going to audit you. And then we tell you, these are the records that we need to examine, which audit is really an examination. These are the the, the documents we need to examine. And it's going to be based on all the taxes that you're eligible for. Um, so again, if you were eligible for corporation business tax, I need to look at your corporate tax return for whatever number of years. If the scope of audit would be for four years, we need to look at it for four years. Mm-hmm. And then including that, you have to look at, like Alex said, again, your balance sheet. We have to look at your, your uh, what he said, cash flow statement, which yes, yes, but we look at it from the government perspective. We say we want to reconcile your bank statement. So it's the same thing as student of cash flow to, to an extent. So when we gave out the record request, we asked for all those documents that pertain to a particular tax. In terms of sales tax, and I'll go back to sales tax because that is that was my specialty. If you were, say, one who provided goods or services that were subject to sales tax, I would then have to start with your tax return, your sales tax return. And then I'll ask you for the source document. So once you provide a source document, that could be um, invoices and all of that. And I will make a determination based on that, review the invoice. Now, if you did not charge sales tax to your client and you should have, I have to flag that and say, no, you should have charged tax on this. And subsequently, we'll uh, come up with an assessment of what you didn't charge. Now, if there's this, um, and we get deeper into that, I, I, when it comes to the law portion of it, um, where I would have to make a determination as to whether 
that particular thing was taxable or not when it comes to services. Because goods, a lot of time, is clear cut. It's either taxable or it's not. When it comes to services, in my state, sometimes it, there was a gray area, and I have to then refer to either the statute or the regulation to determine if that was actually taxable. And I would delve into that. But again, yes, we start off with a record request, asking for these documents and the source documents to review and then make a determination um, as to whether you uh, you were in compliance or not. Who decides uh, the audit or, yeah, who decides? Okay, in my way, I work, we had a whole group of auditors that decided whether a, a company should have been audited or not. And there were certain criteria by which they made that determination. Say, for example, if you were selling goods that should have been taxable and you had 90% of it exempt, saying that, no, I shouldn't have charged tax on this, that's a red flag. And so, of course, it gets pulled for an audit. It gets sent to the field. We get it. We go in and look at the invoices and say, well, listen, you're selling bottles or you're selling chairs. Why didn't you charge sales tax on the chairs that you're selling? And then you have to then provide me with what we call an exemption certificate from who you sold to. Stating, for instance, William is a nonprofit organization. He gave me what is um, his exemption certificate. So therefore, we shouldn't have charged him tax on it. But if you did not charge William tax and William was not an exempt organization, then you're wrong. And then I would charge you the tax. So that's uh, we, so we had a group of people who really determined, um, audit, made audit determination. And then you had some of us who, were, who worked out in the field as auditors. If during an audit, mm -hmm. we noticed an invoice and it was material enough or server invoices for say ABC company and ABC was not paying tax, I'll flag those invoices and I will recommend that ABC company be audited. And that's how you have it snowballing. Well, mm -hmm. can, can, somebody can say, if they follow a complaint and say, you know what, this company is just picking fuss on me all the time. And uh, when you say picking fuss, what do you mean, William? Oh, geez, now we're talking to the auditor. Well, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna tell you auditor, but I'm gonna go to my councilman and say, <laughs> hey, you know, I get audited at I've been audited at why I'm, I'm a, is it, uh, is it something that someone can uh, raise the flag and to evade an audit or once you get flagged, you, you have to deal with it. Actually, no, from my, from my perspective, no, you can. And I will give you again, when if you, you audited at once, if you were audited at once, I I the tax that I dealt with. Uh -huh. if I audit you once, make sure you keep your records. And if I found an assessment, Four years later, I'm going to audit you again. And it's not necessarily Cheryl. It could be another auditor because it could be conflict of interest. And then for fear of you're picking on me, Cheryl. So then somebody else is going to audit you. But I always made it clear to them. I found an assessment. This is what you did wrong. Make sure you keep your records. Make sure you don't make this mistake again. Because four years later, you will be re-audited. Because again, it's compliance. It's not necessarily a got you. But we want to make sure that you comply with the rules and regulations and the statute. Hmm. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This is so, so Alex, you're going to come up next, but I just want everyone to know that when Cheryl walks in as the, as the <laughs> auditor, she's coming with some bitter balls. Alex, <laughs> please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to add on to that, um, who decides um, the audit or who decides what to audit? Um, auditing is mostly by law. So some of those things are enshrined in the companies at, or the country. The countries, different countries got different, different laws. Now, you also alluded to, to the stabbing of slaves. Uh, Act of 2002. Uh, there are requirements in that for publicly traded companies. So, in addition to what the Companies Act requires, that most of the time every company, especially public 
company. When I say public, I don't mean uh, only government company, but public companies could be companies that are owned by more than one person or companies that are traded on an exchange or government governmental company and um, entities. Um, they are required to be audited by law. Sometimes uh, at the minimum annually. So that's a requirement. Um, Sabine Oxley also provide uh, different types of auditing and also requirements for reporting. Chief executive officer, heads of entities are required to do certain things to sign off. Chief financial officers are required to sign off as a result of the Sabine Oxley that you are taking responsibility um, pause, for Alex. those figures. So auditing as like in, in yeah. Well, I wanted to take a step back and let's talk a little bit Hello? about when we talk about Sabine Oxley, okay? Um, tell me, um, now, to my understanding, mm -hmm. before the Sabine Oxley, help me, um, sometimes maybe the chief financial officer or the CEOs and so forth, if a company was cooking the books, they could claim they didn't know because the auditor did the work and sign off, and so they wouldn't be held responsible. And after Sabin Oxley, did that change now where CEOs, even after they move from office, they still can be held liable? Is that something that the Sabin Oxley Act came about that implemented? Just take a second for no, this, this, to talk about Sabin Oxley. This type, yeah, this, this Sabin Oxley only brought it to the fore and it, 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 okay. it brought in additional requirements. But even before the Sabin Oxley, the, the, the owners of the companies, the CEOs and everybody were responsible for the financial statement. Okay. Now, remember now, auditors do not, some people say, oh, but well, the auditors didn't set the system and they won't can audit. No, auditors are not required by law. The entities are required. That's why you hire people that do that, that type of work within your entity or you speak to consultants whose business is to do that kind of work, to set up your policies and procedure. And companies are responsible to produce their financial statements. Auditors are only required to look over the shoulder. So in the, in the work, that's why they have different forms, you know, that tied the entities into taking responsibility for the figures. They have a uh, representation letter. They have different, different parts of the audit uh, standards, the, 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 the standard fee work that uh, the owners of the companies, and even in the auditor's opinion, the auditor's opinion says that the management of the entity is responsible for the figures. The auditor's is only to express an opinion that provides a reasonable assurance based on the audit techniques that was applied. And mind you, most audits are not 100% testing. They are tested on the. Alex, you're there? We still. Sample basis. Okay. The audit case or herself to the auditor's liability, but the management is responsible for the assertions made in the financial statement or, or wherever, production or compliance and all that, all that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Now, Cheryl, we, we, we actually talked about. When you look at audits, um, I would say maybe there are different techniques, right? So in your space, maybe your audit for taxes might be different than someone who's auditing maybe um, a gas or utility company maybe. Um, so tell us these categories of audits, um, help us understand them a little bit, um, what they kind of look like. I know. I'm thinking, Cheryl, this guy, he has a gas station. He has a merchandise store. Okay, the sales tax, the coming in, going out, and so forth. That's a whole nother beast, right, than someone that has a manufacturing company or yeah. someone that has a, uh, a uh, accounting firm. Um, how are professionals, if you are a tax auditor in your role, can I just take you from there and put you into the accounting uh, audits for 
a manufacturer, should I expect that you should be skilled in any of those disciplines or it takes different training? At, well, absolutely. Again, based on my experience, I audited um, various um, types of businesses. And funny you should talk about gas station. I did audit a gas station. Oh, and, man. Yes. Yeah, and, man. And <laughs> the poor man. <laughs> And the thing is, the, the, the fact of the matter is, it was my first and I really didn't know how to do it. So I pulled in one of my colleagues who had done a lot of gas stations. So we had to look at, again, uh, we, we use, I believe, we probably use the um, first in, first out uh, type of method uh, mm-hmm. where we said the gas, this is the price of it because, you know, gas, the price of gas fluctuates. Yeah. So it's really, it, can, it was really tricky and difficult. So I can't, I will not profess to say I knew what I was doing because I brought someone in to help me. Um, so yes, I did audit them and I had to, we had to read. There was a readout on every day. There was a readout showing what was sold, the amount of gas that was in the tank, more gas that was put in the tank. So we had, it was just a whole host of things that we had to do. But let's go, let's move on to manufacturing because that was that was an era that was pretty easy to me. And one of the things, again, it has to do with a lot of times sales tax and other things. Now with manufacturing, um, manufacturing equipment is considered exempt because the thing is you're saying you're producing some kind of good. So pre-manufacturing for us, that's the law, pre-manufacturing will be taxable. But the portion of manufacturing, the process of manufacturing, where they the, say, for instance, this bottle, when it becomes sellable, when it becomes a sellable state, that is the end of manufacturing. And then post-manufacturing will be the shipment part of it. So um, one of the audit that I did, which was a big one, actually, it was not really an audit, but it was more so a conferee type kind of thing. And when I was a conferee, conferee so, what is that, please? Oh, I, I remember for simplicity. It's like I'm a yearings officer. So mm-hmm. I used to be an auditor for about 10 years or so. And then mm-hmm. I got it was like a promo. I became a conferee. So it was like an oversight of the auditor. So if the taxpayer mm-hmm. filed a protest and we're getting to that, uh, I guess that's okay. day two. We'll get into that later on. Thank you. So again, um, the manufacturing aspect of it. So you had to know. What was pre-manufacturing? What was during manufacturing? And what was post-manufacturing? So based on that, I had to make a determination because this this um this guy was really good. This lawyer was really good. And his thing was, oh, no, this is still part of manufacturing. And I said, no, it can't be part of manufacturing because the bottle that your guy is making is already in the sellable state. He said, well, the water, for example, the water is not in the bottle. And I'm like, cool, the water is not in the bottle. But the question is, does your guy make the water? And he was like, well, no. I said, so that means when this bottle was in the sellable state, that was the end of manufacturing and any process after that portion was really shipping. Therefore, the equipment that was used was subject to sales tax. And that's how I got him. So, so Cheryl, very interesting. And I, and I, I want to stay in that space for a second. Um, talk about the knowledge transfer, please. Or how uh, critical is, is it um, when, you know, when you're moving into different industries? Um the knowledge transfer or the knowledge gaps? Are these niche markets sometimes? Are there pieces that are that are missing to where you rely on some senior guys for advice to learn and different things? How does that work in the audit world? How do you train people, move people, have them learn in different various industries? Okay, when I first started as an auditor, um, when I first started as an auditor, I shattered a lot of auditors, senior auditors. Okay. So- since if one auditor was good in what we call cash cases, mm-hmm. uh, cash cases dealt with restaurant business or um, pizzeria and stuff like that. So yeah. that audit was almost like a reverse type kind of audit where you look at if the taxpayer say, well, you know what? I only had 50,000 gross receipts. But no, you can't have 50,000 gross receipts when you purchase all of these items, which amounted to maybe $100,000 in invoices. So how can you purchase $100,000 worth of pizza, 
or cheese to make pizza, but you only have 50,000 receipts because pizza, of course, can be, it's one that's going to go, I mean, the cheese is going to go bad. So it's almost like a reverse world. We said, no, this is not how this works. So right. we, I would shadow someone from that area. And then I will move on to shadowing another person in the manufacturing industry and then go and shadow somebody who knew corporation business tax. So you pick it up. And over the years, you get good with it. You get all these um, cases assigned to you. And the repetition makes you um, makes you better at it, more adept at it. But what was more important to me, though, is one thing to say you're shadowing people, right? And you're learning it on the fly or on the go. But you still have to read. We had like um, an audit manual. You still had to read it. You still had to read the law. We had information. We had laptops that were assigned to us. And all of those laws and stuff were on there. So you did your research while you were auditing. And if you were not certain of something, in my group, in my audit group, all of us exchanged telephone numbers. So when I call up, I'll call one of my buddies. I say, yo, have you seen this before? I just came across this. What's your take on this? I'm trying to research it. I can't find it. And we say, sure, put in this word. And then you would get the, uh, the statue on that. And then I'll do that. So we, we helped each other like that. So again, it, it comes over time. And again, I, I was there for many years. So it became easier as, as, as time went on. Dennis, as you are listening to this, uh, something that comes up, uh, and this is no political side at all. Uh, what I what 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 does concern me is that we lost four auditors in Liberia. And listening to Shara, I can't help but think about the knowledge um, that uh, the knowledge gap. But go ahead with the next uh, comments or question, Dennis. Right, you want to welcome? Okay, if you just join us, this is um, auditing. We have. Chef, Mrs. Cheryl Ray, who was uh, an auditor, and also Mr. Alice Coffey, an internal auditor, and also he's a lecturer in that area. Alice was talking about the different types of audit when I stopped in so that we could get some. So we, we can go briefly into that to, uh, because you see, anytime we hear the name audit, what comes to mind is money or financial audits or auditing people because maybe money is missing. So let, let's talk briefly about different types of audits. Okay, Alex, uh, Alex, hold on, let me. Is he still coming? If not, Dennis, we yeah, can. Yeah, yeah, I gotta, we gotta do something. Okay. Well, so, so Alex, you, you give me a stop about the different types of audit. And if possible, relate those to Liberia, if you can. Just unmute yourself, Alex, and let's talk about the types of audits. Good. Now, I'm, I'm in business. Yeah. <laughs> my internet decided to uh, receive my computer now. Okay. Good. So, like you were saying, um, we talk about uh, financial audit, we talk about compliance, uh, we talk about product, I mean, production audit. Um, so, there's an array of audit. We talk about tax, uh, tax auditing as well. So there's this different um, types and classification of, of audit. Um, it will also interest you to know that all kinds of things are audited, including the beauty pageant and all is audited. So if you want to know what is audited, everything is audited. Your production, your production uh, um, processes at uh, your manufacturing company is also audited. So you're running. Uh, beer factory or Coca-Cola factory or Pepsi factory, those things are audited. So that's 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 how they audit. And um, William was talking about, um, and and Shara tried to answer that question uh, from the public auditing side of things, and even on the government side of things. Um, um, the auditing companies, because say. Price Waterhouse Coopers or Ensign Young or Deloitte and Touche or the national companies, they select people. Sometimes some of them they have specialty people who specialize in different industry. So they have audit teams that specialize in those different 
industry. Some of the, some auditing firms, the smaller one or the national companies, they do general. I mean, they can put you on any audit, any industry at any time. So like everybody sort of. But to some extent, when I work for Presbyterian, for example, to some extent, there is some level of the kind of industries that you can work in. So for example, when I work with Presbyterian School first, I work mostly on international development projects, say projects that were funded by World Bank, UN, you know, uh, IMF, uh, European Union, those kind of development projects. And then I also specialize on auditing non-for-profit, big non-for-profit, American non-for-profit, as well as gold mining. And then um, the stock exchange business, flotation of, you know, selling of shares, those kind of um, things. So yes, they, they, they can be division of labor and even on an audit team, they are division, they are different people. Like, like if you look at the military, you have the CEO, you have the sergeant, you have the lieutenant, they have different levels. You have the audit manager, you have the audit supervisor, you have the audit senior, you have the few people. So, and it's done by standard. It's not mm -hmm. done off the bat. It's done by well-documented, internationally accepted audit standards. Yeah. Alex, I wanted you to comment too on as to uh, the different types of audits we have in Liberia. Do we have sometimes audit processes? Do we have compliance audit? You have experience there. What are some of the types of audits we do in Liberia? So in Liberia, um, the same type of audit, auditing that's done around the world is done in Liberia. We have internal audit done in like, you know, most entities, um, they have their auditing department, that's the internal audit. And they also have auditing firms that come in to perform their external, their external auditing. Um, in government, they also have the internal side of the, the auditing, which is the internal audit agency, which is embedded into government uh, transactional process. Then they have the GAC. By law, they, it is required that the GAC perform audit of every government institution at least once a year. Would that be compliance yeah. audit or, or financial audit they will be conducting or what is it? So GAC will normally do what they call the system audit. That is the combination of financial and compliance audit. So they would do uh, that system audit that encompasses everything. Okay, Cheryl, you you want to add? You wanted to say something before I? Oh, but it's interesting, and I'm glad. And and Dennis, when you and I talked off the show, and as well as Alex and I did, I said this is a learning thing for all of us. Granted, I may have been an auditor for many years, but albeit a government auditor, but Alex brings a wealth of knowledge of audit knowledge from various backgrounds, various types of audit that, that, that he has, um, he has worked with. So he just taught me something new, you know, mm -hmm. when it comes to Liberia, because I really don't know much about Liberian audit. I would just make the assumption and probably do research and say, this is it. Mm -hmm. But just in that little uh, short answer that he gave, um, based on the question you asked, I've learned something new. So all of uh -huh. us are learning. It's not only the viewers that are learning, all of us are. Great. And if you are, if you are being, um, uh, I don't want to say, if you've been selected for audit, does it mean you're in trouble? Or should you? Not necessarily. Some... Not necessarily. I will take that. Not necessarily that you're in trouble. You will only be in trouble if, if you don't have your documents to prove that whatever you have taken as an exemption or taken credit for that you can't, you don't have any proof, then that could be you're in trouble, but not, Trouble, it depends on the definition of trouble. Trouble mm -hmm. could be, yes, I will owe the government $2,000 and I have to pay in installments plus penalty and interest that will be assessed. Or trouble could be you owe the government so much that you could be locked up. It could be fraud that you could be locked up. So it depends on the degree of trouble. Another thing could be if you ordered it and there's really no material difference. If it's not significant enough, you could then just be reprimanded saying, listen, for the future, this is a mistake that you made. Be mindful of it. This is okay. You owe the government $50. We're not going to assess you the $50 or the $100. 
Just make sure you don't make this mistake in the future. So again, it depends on the degree of trouble that you're looking at. So when you get when you get a notice that you're being audited, it's not the end all. You don't start like fretting or being so afraid. Oh God, I'm going to be locked up or whatever. No, not necessarily so. Mm. And Alex, you can jump in if you if you want to. So on, uh, yeah, to that to that note, um, she's right. You don't you don't you don't necessarily have to be afraid, but. And there's there's a natural tendency that um, human the humankind is um, is weary of of investigation is weary of of auditors. That is why um, when you are an auditor, you have to you have to find a way. Like what I normally say is that um, from the, you know quoting from the old man, you have to. Be smooth to the extent that you lead the person to the grave in a way that they will look forward to the trip. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're leading the person to the grave, but the person is happy. Oh, yeah, I'm going to the grave. You have to lead the person to the grave in a way that will look forward to the trip. So it, it's, but naturally, mm-hmm. people are afraid of auditing, investigation. Mm-hmm. People are naturally afraid of somebody looking over their shoulder. That they feel it's like you're going for a test for any sickness, and you know you you clear, but something <laughs> in your mind gets you afraid. That um, yeah. so once the auditor is coming, you still get afraid. You know, just, but, just, but, just to piggyback off of what Alex said, I guess Alex is absolutely right. It's 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 more so authority. People are afraid of authority. You're driving and you see the cop behind you. You know you're not going fast. But you panic, and that's pretty much what we auditors uh, uh, are faced with. As soon as we get we get a notice, or taxpayer get a notice that yes, they're going to be audited, they mm-hmm. start to panic. And so, I mean, with me, I always use my charms, like like Alex said, lead the person to the grave, but be very nice about it. I smile. Oh, sure, your accent, yes, it's from Liberia, West Africa, you know. And I'm like, I'm a I'm a good talker, and I put you at ease. But in the end, you probably got billed like millions of dollars. And I'll be like, you know what? It could have been a lot more. So I'm really cutting you a slack here. And, and, and I had the, the, the privilege of really getting taxpayers to pay. And, and my supervisor, asked when I was an auditor, he was always very surprised. Cheryl, how do you get people to pay these hundreds of thousands of dollars to the tune of sometimes millions? I said, I mm. guess it's just my charms and, you know, my wit or whatever. Yeah. You, you 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 really get a champ, Alex. There's a question here for you from Sam Wallow because uh, you have the uh, Labrin experience. He says here, yeah, can the auditor with experience in Labrin government audits please please take us through a real example of an audit conducted and what prevented the prosecution of officials found to have been misappropriated the form? There were several examples under the past administration. What I want you to do is to, without getting into the uh, prosecution part of it. Walk us through a real life example of an audit done in Liberia. Then I will, I will do that and I will attempt to, to, to answer his question as well because his, I think his, his question is it's a germane question. It's a, it's a you know, well-founded question. So uh, we must take some time to, to address such question. Um, walk you through a normal audit. Now, the normal audit, whether you come from the government side, whether you come from the external auditing side, it's all similar. You know, first of all, the auditing entities are selected, whether by law or by request. And on on the private side of the of the companies, not the government. The government audit uh, is this, I mean, the private companies, like the publicly traded company, they audit, the audit, the, the process or the decision to audit is determined most likely by the board of directors. And it's the board of directors that appoint the auditors. So while in, in, in reporting, the auditors report administratively to the CEO and functionally to the board of directors. 
in government audit like in Liberia, the General Auditing Commission, um, Auditor General reports functionally to the national legislature and administratively to the president. Now, the audit entity is decided by the law says you must audit every entity. <clears throat> then GAC goes and determine or the, the GAC determines which entity it has to audit based on materiality or based on the, your, your, the percentage of the budget, the government annual budget that you take. So if any entity has say, for example, 10% of the budget, why the other entities have less than that, that entity is subject to an annual audit. The audit is spread depending on, the, sometimes the audit, the audit is, the, not every entity is audited during the year. Sometimes they say, okay, any entity that is below zero point something will be audited every three years. And then those that are be, below, uh, above a certain threshold will be audited every year. That's based on that structure of maturity. Now, so there's, there's a selection, there's the planning. The plan, the audit, and they come up with an audit plan. That audit plan includes what is going to be audited, whether they're going to be auditing receivables or whether they'll be auditing the government revenue account or whether they'll be auditing inventory. To what extent they are going to audit, that is the maturity level, that is again, they do what we call analytical review. That analytical review tell you the percentages of each component of the financial statement to the overall. Again, it's decided. The maturity level is decided. The sampling, the sampling techniques is decided during the planning process. And then also you talk about resources. People, what level of people you need for that audit? What experience you need? Who is going to be the audit assistant? Who is going to be the trainee? Which trainee you're going to, you know, you know, and, and let me say this, that even though it sounded very cool that, oh, you, you audit the person in a way that will look forward to the trip, but auditing certain entities, especially where people know that things have happened, is very difficult. Most especially auditing government entities is very difficult because almost always things are happening. Even some private companies, things have, have had experience, experiences where private companies, you know, where there, there was a rough terrain. So once the audit is planned, then you do the fee work. You got, go out to the, the, to the government office and conduct the audit, come back and compile your report, all your evidences, everything, put it together. And then the auditor general reviews that, is satisfied with a sign up on it. That report goes to the president and it goes to the legislature. Now in Liberia, they let the national legislature, which received the audit report, has a committee, a joint committee of the representative and the House of the Senate and the House of Representatives. We will call it a joint public account committee. That joint public account committee has a technical team that was established. They received the audit report. Now, the audit report in itself assigned by the Auditor General, it is not an indictment. It doesn't take anybody to quote right away. The PSC looks at it, and as Shara said, she was, I don't know what word she used, she was a hearing officer. There is a hearing held, public <laughs> hearing. The PSC holds a public hearing, and, they, and people are, you know, clear or because people make different representation, people write people, talk, people bring documentations, they talk during the hearing and after the hearing, before the hearing, they bring documentation. And based on the assessment of the, the public account committee technical, they can decide, you know, at the end of the day, based on our judgment, they can say, okay, this person is finally guilty. And again, it can be as low as administrative uh, um, issues that the president will just slap you on your on your on your wrist. Go, don't do it again. Or it can lead to suspension, or it can lead to dismissal, and those kind of those kind of things. Some of them can lead to what we call uh, uh, um, 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 pay the money back. You have to pay that money back. That money has to be recovered 
by the government. Muted. So sometimes you make you make a payment plan. You make a payment plan and pay. Uh, for example, um, in Liberia, uh, the latest there was a there was a um, the the PSC, the Public Account Committee, did some and people some people are, are paying up to now. Now, so to uh, to go to answer uh, my the, the, the my brother's uh, question there. Um, Yes, there were a lot of audits that were performed during the previous government. The process was launched for the PAC to look at the audit reports and bring people, and they did that to some extent during the previous, during the previous government. They did that. And some people even up to date, I mean, it's public information. Like for example, the, the former education minister on Ellen Johnson Salif government, was paying some money back, you know? And even I was subject to that situation and I was exempted, I, you know, I was exempted, it, you know? So, so those things work, but it depends on the government and what they want to do. Now, sometimes it depends if the government is, you know, lukewarm on, on audit reports, then the audit report will stay in the PSC and they will never get out, but there's a process a well-defined process that is established in Liberia for this audit. For the Auditor General, after the Auditor General conducts his audit is finished, it goes to the PSC, the PSC do the hearing, and some people are cleared and some people are not cleared. Some people, if you don't pay the money within a certain period, then you're subject to a, a, a prosecution. Then they forward you to the Ministry of Justice or they forward you to LACC. So if there are criminal matters that are involved, if they are criminal matters, those matters are right ahead, lifted and sent to the GSC. And I was the head of the, 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 the financial intelligence unit, so I am aware that a lot of cases were forwarded to the, uh, to the, to the LACC for investigation and, and, and to be prosecuted through the Ministry of Justice. Thank you. But again, I, like I said, it depends on the government of the day. Right. It depends the, on the government of the day. Dennis, go ahead. No, no you yeah. go ahead. Um, Unmuted. Yeah. Um, what I want to want to ask is, uh, in what instances uh, sometimes can an auditor fiduciary role or duty uh, can lead to uh, compromise, or how do you train? Uh, about the fiduciary role and comprom and you know that role being compromised. Tell us a, a little bit about you know versus classroom versus real life experience where it hits the road. Yeah, first of all, auditors. Uh, the audit team is a unique. It's a unique. Um, it's a unique practice, and it's subject to standards, international standards that are that are well-documented, people adapt. And a lot of professional auditors belong to professional organization, whether it be the uh, CIA, the Certified Internal Audit, whether it be the CPA, Certified Public Accounting, whether it be the CFE, Certified Fraud Examiner, whether it be the CPA, the Government Audit, uh, you know, body, body, you know, all these different, different institutions. The people belong to them, they, they are guided by ethics and standards. The audit process is guided by internationally defined audit. Audit GSC belongs to all these different organizations. So they guide their process through well accepted. And there's something called peer review, your work that you do, another firm checks it. So auditors are, are subject to these things. Now, auditors have something to call the sign off. When, when I worked in, 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 in with Pricewaterhouse, we sign every every year. We sign what we call the independence bond. That is, your the daughter the daughter living with you in a house. You not even have shares in this company. They're, they're, you know you should not do this. You should not be served on board of directors. Day you should not have shares in this. You should not have even have you know all these things are signed off. 
So auditors are supposed to be independent in fact and in, in appearance. Mm, okay. the way appearance means the way you even deal with the auditee, the staff, the way you deal with them. How are, how are, and in fact, yeah. by, by law. I'm trying to, yeah. Alex, let me, let me uh, bring in our callers into the conversation. Uh, I see uh, Frank Gibson. So back, back room, if you can, um, if you can unmute the line, let have Frank Gibson to. Muted. I think we have an issue with our line. So let me go back to Cheryl, maybe just to re-emphasize this. Why is audit important? One second, Dennis. Cheryl, one second. Go ahead, Anthony. We already know that. Cheryl. Muted. Yeah, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. Okay, we're having some technical issues here. So Cheryl, let's use this time to tell us why is audit important? That could be a very sec good segue to get into our uh, colors, and then we can draw the curtains. Yeah, audit is important because um, you want to have a snapshot uh, in time of where you are, um, I guess from the private perspective. From the government perspective, um, I always said that for, for example, if, if you're paying um, through your payroll deduction taxes, it's important that a businessman, a CEO or um, a corporation or a sole proprietor pays his fair share because taxes that are garnered, that are received, provide services to all of us. And it's, it's, it's unfair to have you pay monies, and then you have someone, say, for example, who has his own business, using all of his, using all of his, um, his money to do whatever. That's unfair to you and I, because that would mean if there are, if we need police officers to take care of us, there's not enough resources to take care of that. If we need uh, the roads to be paved, there's not enough resources only because some people choose not to pay their fair share. So it's really important to have to, to have audits. Again, this is not necessarily a gotcha, but it's just to make sure that people are complying with the rules mm -hmm. and, and, and the laws. But, but Cheryl, um, people, people have used audit has got you, right? Let's mm -hmm. say, for instance, IRS in the United States, and uh, sometimes the government will tell IRS to say, look at that person. Okay, again, again, I, I think I spoke about that earlier when we talk about reasons why people are selected for audit. Okay, people, you just don't be audited because they just pick you up. And yet and there are times where it could be a random audit. But for the most part, based on my experience, we're not just going to look at Dennis. Everything checks out on his tax return and say, well, I'm going to audit Dennis. If, for, for example, the IRS, I will speak with the IRS. IRS requires that if you're... Um, if you're going to exempt, say, for example, um, you have medical expenses, right? The law, and, and, and um, Alex can probably, anybody can correct me on it. I believe the excess over 7.5% of your gross income is what you can use to write off. So if you decided, you then just decided, you're just going to throw in any dollar amount. I'm going to throw in $15,000 to reduce my taxes. But when in fact, your, your yeah. medical expenses were not that much, or let's say 50,000, 15,000 is too low. You yeah. throw out there 50,000, but your, your total income was say about 75,000. Now, realistically, to say that you paid 50,000 in medical expenses, sometimes it, it, it creates a red flag. Right. So it creates a red flag and then we're going to have to look at it. Oh, that we have been having problem with the phone line. So let me bring in Frank Gibson. Uh, Frank, Frank, go ahead. You are live. Frank, are you there? Hello. Yeah, go ahead. You're live. Where hello. Yeah. Uh, 
I want to ask the, the brother there from Liberia, who is Alice Alice Coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, do Do you work with the GAC or the LACC? Because my my problem here is with the issue of uh, access declarations when it comes to when it comes to financial problem in Liberia. What actually is the ruling on the on the on this uh, access declaration? And my, my 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 last point is, I just want to make a little bit observation of when auditors in a country when they are auditing frames and other areas, I think those are people who need to be very careful with themselves. They are not people who who, who are to be found everywhere every time because I think it play a little bit on their own lives their own security because auditing people who will be paying huge amount of money to government sometimes they go after those auditors who are auditing them so i think they need to be careful with their own lives i think so thank, thank you very much thank you alex yeah yeah frank um mr gibson frank um you, you were correct on your second point and i was going to come to that on the, yeah, even though we, we're sounding a little rosy about auditing and the processes, but there is the, the fragile situation as well. Um, and, I, and I have experiences in different countries on how, you know, auditors can be, it can be attacked. So those things are there. But, you know, I know, I, I mean, to the first part of your question, I'm not in Liberia right now. I worked in Liberia for a number of years. I was the head of the Financial Intelligence Unit um, until last year. Um, I collaborated with the LACC, the Liberia Anti-Corruption Commission. So I know a little bit about the asset dec declaration and the asset declaration thing is by law. When I was uh, head of the entity, I also declare my asset. Every, there's a requirement every three years, uh, you, when you are appointed to everywhere, whether it's a new appointment, fresh appointment, whether it's you are heading another entity and they take you to another entity. And there's a regulation, more than there is in, a strike in the law and there's a regulation on that. In fact, the, the revised regulation I was part of the, the, the one of person who, you know, um, wrote that, uh, that as, uh, asset declaration regulation. So positions are defined. For example, all appointed position, once the president appoints you, you are supposed to declare your asset. As far as the military, certain ranks in the military, even the military has to, um, they have to declare their asset by law. So every if you're appointed by the president, whether you're assistant minister, whether you're minister, whether you whatever, you have to declare your asset. If they're changing you from different area to another area, you have to declare your asset. When I was the head of the FIU, I declared my asset. When I was immediately appointed, I declared my asset. That was in fact a requirement for you to be commissioned. Right. At that time, one of the early government, there was a requirement for you to be commissioned. And after three years, I declared my asset again. I was called by the LACC, my friend, you have not declared your asset. And I went and declared my asset. And that report is sent normally to the president. So if you don't send that report, the president will call you out. So quickly, everybody. Uh, so it's, it's by law that you have to declare your asset. On the issue of, of, of fragility of auditors, yes, you know, auditors can be, auditors can be, you know, pushed or for lack of a better way, attacked in different ways. Sometimes people can try to bribe you or sometimes people can try to coerce you or wrap you or, you know, do different things to convince you to make things good for them. Sometimes they try the money side, for example, when I was auditing, I was in Ghana, I was auditing an entity that tried to bring the broad envelope. 
I don't even know because I didn't open the envelope. I took it straight to my manager and my manager received it. And there was, it was not in my business to, I was a senior on the position. I was a supervisor. I was on the heading the field team, but he brought it to me. And the way he gave it to me, he just gave it to me like that. I didn't know, I told the documentation when I received it and I was, oh. So I reported it to my manager and my manager handled it. So I also was on the other team and we went to inspect in one of the towns. And then one of my colleagues, we went to do inspection on a World Bank funded project of loans that were given out. And the, the guy got blind. You know, the guy got blind. How the guy got blind, we don't know, but the guy got blind. And I mean, in Liberia, different things have happened. So, and um, so, so, so Mr. Mr. Us have Mr. different Mr. Mr. ways that things can, they can be all... attacked. But auditors have to be careful too. Like you said, mm -hmm. they have to be careful. They have to manage their security. It depends on the fragility of the situation. So like if looking at Liberia now, maybe will you advise and undercover auditors or <laughs> plain clothes auditors so that people don't really know that these are the auditors? Is that is that a in Liberia? Yeah, is that a thought? Or is it even possible? Alex, you making I a statement or are you asking a question? I'm Alex, asking a question. Alex, can I come Throwing in? Some spaghetti on the wall. Let Alex, Cheryl come in. Let me see. Cheryl wants to come in. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Alex have already explained pretty much how it works in Liberia, Dennis. Unfortunately, as auditors, you can be undercover. You can be an undercover investigator. Auditors, we have to identify themselves because we need documents to audit. We need the records. So how can you be undercover? As an investigator, yes, you can be. And that's a difference between being an investigator and an auditor. It's, it's very unfortunate that I guess what's happening is happening. And yes, in, in here in the U.S., as an auditor, we were advised. I mean, you sign off, like Alex said, you sign off your first and your last child when you when you be an auditor or you're working for government, you can't accept this. I mean, sometimes you can't even accept a bottle of water for fear that the optics will look like you're being bribed. So yes, we're very mindful of that. And if we felt um, again, if I went to an audit where I felt threatened, I was told drop everything. If it means leave the government issue computer, the laptop, leave it and jet, just leave. But fortunately, I didn't get to that point. I just said, excuse me, sir, we will deal with this later on. I have to leave. And I packed the government computer and I left. I called my boss right after and said, I felt threatened because he was yelling. I said, I felt threatened and I was alone. And so I left. You know, so again, yes, we can be in a tenuous situation and you just have to be mindful of that. But to answer your question again, uh, Dennis, is, is I don't think it's possible to be undercover auditor. Hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, Alex. Thank you, Cheryl. You, you can, you can. Thank you for for that answer. You can be an undercover. You can be an undercover cop. You can be, like for example, in financial intelligence, you can be highly confidential, highly secretive about that that job you're doing, because you you know it, it, by a design, it's required that you're very highly confidential. But auditing, you can be you can be undercover. You gotta go. The team, other team, have to, has to go. It's like investigation. You have to call the people in and ask for documentation and and ask for everything. You can even ask for the, uh, the you know, the their intestine. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm just I'm just literally putting it that way. You have to ask for because one of the things is according to the standard is you have to open the doors for the auditors to enter, and you have to have you let them have free access on un unhindered access to all required documentation under the body and under the investigation as well so if you start to hide things if you try to prevent them then you are hindering their work but again um it depends in government auditing it depends on like i said it depends on the government of the day it depends on how far <laughs> the government's policies, and not just only the policy or how far the government wants to go with the auditing, how far the government wants to stamp up corruption, how far. So it depends on the government. Okay. okay. We have an issue with our phone line. Let me read one question and then we're gonna be getting your final statement and close the broadcast. 
uh, from Eduardo, can Cheryl or Alex describe what has prompted them to issue an adverse opinion in an audit and why? First of all, what is an adverse opinion? Why will anybody issue it? And what is your experience with that? Uh, let uh, me start. I'm, I'm a, um, let me, Alex, let me go first. And you can come from, the, from, the, from the private perspective. I was a government auditor. Um, when you say adverse opinion, we I, I issued a determination. And a determination in the sense that if it was adverse, adverse, if I understood Edward correctly, would be against the taxpayer. If there were discrepancies showing that the taxpayer owed more money, I guess you can consider that adverse. I issued a bill and I wrote my narrative indicating that based on all of the examination of these records, based on the statute and the law, this is what you owe. So if this is what he calls adverse, I guess that's adverse because it's not, it's not pro, it wasn't pro the taxpayer because there was an additional amount that he owed. So um, from the government's perspective, that's, I guess, would be what I would consider adverse. So the private perspective, Alex, go ahead. So um, that question is a textbook question. And I would try to answer it the textbook way, not the practical way. I've had um, practical situations where I've issued adverse opinion. So there are four different types of opinion that the auditor can issue. And they can be called different ways depending on which book you look in or depends on where you come from. So there is a unqualified opinion. Unqualified opinion means reasonably, with reasonable assurance, your assertions are clean. For example, in the financial statement, your financial statement, the figures that you put in your financial statement re represent a true and fair view of your the operation of your entity for that period. Qualified opinion means it's, it's like subject to. That means subject to maybe didn't do your bank reconciliation and your, your bank balance is high as compared to all the other things on the balance sheet. And so therefore, if your reconciliation is not completed, that means all your receivables are so high that we could not um, we could not um, get verification from your customers, from your 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 credit, your customers that um, they agree with the balances that you're posting for them, you know those kind of things. Adverse opinion where is there's multiple of things that have happened. You know, you know, qualified opinion is subject to this meaning that we will express an opinion, but there is a little glitch in this thing that we can let it pass, but it's, it's a point of concern. Adverse means, nope, there's too many things that have happened. On that basis, we can. These things are so enormous that your financial statement does not represent a true and fair view for the period. Disclaimer then means, hey, sometimes the guy does not even prepare the financial statement or he does not prepare certain schedules and we just, our audit has been hindered. Mm -hmm. That means we, we don't have access to the records. We don't have free access to the people and those kind of things. Then we can disclaim that uh -uh, we can not issue an opinion. So most people want to be at the unqualified opinion. And sometimes uh, they can pass with the qualified opinion depending on the materiality of the item they're talking about. But, 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 but when, there's still, when there's too material and too many things have happened, then it's an average situation. All right. Hold on, uh, Francis, I've been trying to call and then he's been having problems. So let me read this one question from him and then William can go back to you. Okay. He said, uh, I would like to get an understanding if an auditing is in process does the auditor work along with the company accounting personnel or just ask questions when they need to understand something? 
And we, we didn't really get through to the audit process. We're going to go in our next one, but uh, that's that's the question. When we do an audit, do you work along with the your company accounting people, or you just ask them question on a has needed basis? Yeah. So um, most audit, especially with financial statement audit, or even most audit. So in this case, you're talking about accounting. So in the financial audit, typically during the audit, conf the the preliminary work, the planning process, the um, the auditor would meet with the auditee. They will have certain discussion and blah blah blah. And then people would be assigned. For example, if it's a financial auditor audit, the chief accountant or the head of finance or the controller would be designated to the extent that even the room, the conference room or whatever room, or the, they will sit, is the person who is in charge of that audit for that company. Most likely is the controller or the chief financial officer who is designated to deal with the auditors in a financial statement audit. And so the, audit, the auditors will either be situated in a secure room, in a board room, or in a room in a finance department, which will have lock and key and everything. This, the CFO or the controller, who is the highest ranking finance officer, will have the right and anything they want in the market. It depends on the company too, okay? And they will have other officers that are designated, that are sub-designated for if you... If you want to deal with production, you can contact the production manager. If you want to deal with uh, sales, contact the sales manager. The documents that you want, you send a list to the, the CFO or the controller, like that. Yes, so there could be a designated person. It's always good to have a designated person who the auditors can talk to. Thank you. William, we can close. What do you think? Oh, oh yeah, I think I think this is this is very good. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you're tuning in to Focus on Liberia, we've kind of laid the foundation in part one of our series. We're talking about auditors, the profession. Uh, it shouldn't be overlooked. These are these are folks who they're quiet. They don't come into the media limelight, but the job is very important, is very critical. And uh, so we've just been very fortunate to have a couple of Liberians who have been sharing with us the width, breadth, and depth of of the profession. And so we're gonna continue this. The next time that we will be on, uh, we have uh, quite a few questions that we're gonna ask and we want all our listeners to tune in. Some of the questions, just to give you a little tidbit, is what happens if an entity is not audited? What are the consequences? What happens when an auditor is in a situation where it gets life-threatening? What are some of the danger signs? And what happens if a uh, company just decide that, you know what, we're going to disregard any and everything audit? Are there any consequences? And more importantly, where is Liberia with the audit? And are we heading to a rogue state or not? Those are some of the questions we're going to be uh, looking to our panelists to answer on the next show. Once again, I'm William King, and I will uh, yield it back to you, Dennis. I think we always gave about a minute so 30 seconds to our panelists with a closing remark. Uh, and then I'll let you wrap it up, Dennis. Thank you. So let's get to your closing remarks. Thank you so much for spending the evening with us. Let's start with you, Cheryl. Um, again, thank you, Dennis and William, for having me. Um, I hope that what my learned brother, Alex, have imparted as well as I have. I hope that it will it would have answered some questions that some people have had. Um, additionally, I've learned a lot also from um, Alex, and I look forward to the next um, segment where we will be answering those questions and talk about um, from the governmental standpoint. That's that's where I bring knowledge from, um, and I can say what pretty much is done when you um, refuse to submit to us and what the government has the power to do the government that that is a government in the u.s so again thank you so much for having me and i look forward to um, joining you um during the next um show thank you thank you sir thank you. alex i i don't know how to call you alexander alex is okay you call me anything 
All right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks for the, the, the show. Thanks, uh, Cheryl, for your insightful tax auditing, hearing officers, you know, experience that you share with us. Um, we look forward to coming on uh, next Saturday to expand on, on, on the topic. Thank you. Thank you. This evening at 7 o'clock, we're going to be here, right here on Focus on Liberia because we are in the business of educating elevating and promoting all things Liberia. We're going to have a show on oral history of Liberia. Someone born in the 1960s was there when President Tadma was president, all the way to Taylor. So we will have Liberian oral history from Tadma to Taylor. Tonight will be series one. You don't want to miss that. I want to thank you again for coming. Thanks to all our viewers for hanging in here with us. Continue to support us, like our Facebook page. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have time, go on our website, focusonlibrary.net. Scroll down at the bottom. There's a PayPal there. If you want to contribute anything to help us uh, do what we do, please feel free. We need all the support we can, so it has to keep this going. You can have the entertainment, everything else, somewhere else. Here at Focus on Liberia, we do the real stuff. Keep coming. Thanks. As always, my name is Dennis Jai. We're going to be closing with our song, We Are All Liberian. Whether the audit is compliant audit, is financial audit, whether you are the auditor or the auditee, we are all Liberians. And let us do whatever we can humanly possible to make Liberia that glorious land of liberty by God's command. Good night and God bless. <laughs> We all love you, man. Yeah.